Hello, everybody. Uh, very good evening. Thank you for uh, saying such kind words about me. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Panditji, for being so kind to me, the Kashmir Files, Kashmiri Hindus, and the cause of Kashmir. The theme of today is Kashmiri Hindus and the Western world. Uh, I've spoken a lot on Kashmir, and every time when we add uh, Kashmiri Hindus, Kashmiri problem, Kashmiri Kashmiri, it looks like we are talking about some isolated people or some other group. It doesn't sound very inclusive to me. So let's just say Hindus and the Western world. Because when you say Hindus and the Western world, then we are talking in the right context. Kashmir is just one of the problems created by the Western worlds in India, and they are milking it. Kashmir is a, at the center of conflict, which is an eternal conflict. The conflict actually is between East and West. The way of looking at things, looking at life, the world, this cosmos. And if you see the entire Eastern philosophy, the center of Eastern philosophy is Bharat. Whatever philosophy, cultural practices, religious practices, the way of governing, the way of family and the society, which you see in the East, you'll find at the center is Bharatiya thinking. In Japan, you have Zen. Zen actually, if you, somebody, you should do this research, if you see all of Asia uh, after Bharat on the eastern side, all of them, their central philosophy comes from only one word, which is Dhyan. Dhyan is a fundamental Hindu word. And this was like science has discovered so many things. It was spiritual scientists who discovered that Dhyan is a medicine like you have medicine for uh, your vaccine for COVID and different diseases. Similarly, a disease called a uh, confused mind or unanswered questions of life, the remedy was dhyan. This dhyan then was synthesized by Buddhists. And they took this thought, they started traveling. So first they went to China. In China, you don't have dha, so dhyan became chen. Chen is their central philosophy. S then, up to, up to Japan, all these countries, Vietnam, Cambodia, Korea, North Korea, South Korea, every single country which you will find in East, Far East, in Pacific uh, region, you will find all of them, the central philosophy is from only one word, dhyan. And in Japan, the, see, from India, from Dhyan, from China, it became Chen. From China, when it reaches uh, Japan, it becomes Dhyan or Zen because they don't have Cha, so it became Zen. The family system in Japan, which you see drinking together, actually that is a forum for discussion, for debate. People sit in the evening, they discuss most important questions of the day, and we also, we still practice the same thing. It's not glorified because we don't know how to market our own concepts. Japan was very smart. They, in 70s and 80s, when they had industrial boom, they also marketed Zen, Kaizen, Ikagai, and all those terms, which actually, if you look at the definition of all those terms, all of them you'll find were, actually you'll find in Vedanta and Upanishads uh, everywhere. I, am, I particularly talk about Vedanta and Upanishad because that is philosophy and it's not religious. So Hindus and Western world. So if you look at me from the Western eye, you see what happened at Oxford University. I'm sure you know the uh, Oxford Union had invited me. So officially Oxford Union, a lot of people think who invites what. So offic officially Oxford Union invited, where some of the top most people have spoken earlier. And Oxford Union, just a few hours before the event, 
sent an email saying that sorry we made a double booking. But the real reason just now there was a student I know he must should be here from Oxford. Yeah, he's sitting there. He was also telling me the same thing. And everybody told me, and which is for any intelligent person, it's common sense to figure out what was the reason. Because just a couple of days before that, uh, some students, some Hindu also, a uh, lot of Pakistani and Muslim students, and primarily students who think from the Western, who have a Western perspective about things. And they ran a campaign against me, calling me all those things which the Western world believes mostly about Hindus. So my biggest, what is my biggest crime? My biggest crime is I'm a Hindu. On top of that, I'm a Brahmin. So I have to be a patriarch, 100%. I have to be, I'm a man. So I have to be a misogynist. <laughs> I am in some kind of a position of power. So obviously, I am an exploiter, oppressor. I support Modi, so I am a fascist, <laughs> undeniable. I, I, I talk a lot about Vedanta and Upanishad, and I uh, believe I am a follower of Vivekananda, so that makes me a regressive Hindu, because I am talking about the past. Then, I made, when I made this film called Buddha in a Traffic Jam, which exposed urban nexels, on that day, they started calling me Sanghi. At that time, I had nothing to do with politics, absolutely nothing to do with politics. I did not even understand mainstream politics the way I do now. It was back in 2010 and 11 when I made this film. And nobody, I mean, even God wouldn't have predicted that Mr. Modi is going to be the Prime Minister of India in 2010. In fact, no Hindu would have ever thought that there will be any Hindu government in the center. So at that time, I made this, but they started calling me Sanghi. And then I made the Tashkent Files, which was about the uh, controversial death or murder of uh, Sri Lal Bahadur Shastri. So because it uh, involved Congress, so they started calling me Bhakt. So that's how I became a Bhakt. So when I became a Sanghi and Bhakt and a misogynist and a fascist and a Nazi and all kinds of those adjectives they gave me, then I said, Ab kya farak padta hai? Ab chalo, aag mein kood jate hai. And then I made the Kashmir files. So only one adjective they had not used for me, now they use that too, Islamophobic. So now I'm a complete human being. This is the problem with the Western world when they look at us. Indians look very simple, but all simple things are very complex. In fact, complexity is the most simple thing. The problem with the West, and this I am talking very openly in a very candid manner, and you can also treat it as an academic. It's coming after many, many years of my personal research. The, the fundamental difference between the East and the West is that in the East, we find simple explanations for complex things. You say Vasudev Kutumkam. It's a very complex concept. Don't go by how politicians use it. And I see it's become fashionable. Everybody uses it. We Hindu means Vasudev Kam. It's not so simple. It's a very, very complex concept. But it has been made very simple for you. And that's why we look very simple people. With the West, the problem is they make even simplest of the things sound and look very complex. And it is not, if you ask somebody, where is the toilet? That's it. Toilet is outside here on your left. They will say, get down three steps, take a left, then take a right, open the door, then there will be another door. Open that door, they will be on the left, and on the right side is the door. I, it actually happened with me. I was in USA. We were looking for a location, and I went to see a house. You know, it was an apartment. And uh, so I asked for the toilet, and the way she explained it to me, I thought it must be a 10-bedroom or 12-bedroom house. 
It turned out to be a studio apartment, one bedroom and one living room and one bathroom. <laughs> it is true, they like to use jargons. Every year they want to coin new terms. When your life is hollow, you start depending on jargon. You need definition for everything. You need explanation for everything. We don't do that. We take things for granted. There are two different worlds. You'll see in India, nobody will ever tell you, don't take me for granted. A typical Hindu Indian will never, even Muslim won't tell you, even any, it doesn't matter what is your religion, but in India, nobody will, you take me, in fact, people will feel bad if you don't take them for granted. <laughs> if there is a shadi, and you don't give a job to your third and fourth cousin, he'll feel bad because you have not taken him for granted. <laughs> but in the West, you can't even expect your children or your parents to do something for you without asking for it. And that too if they are free at a convenient time. If you see historically, the West has always recorded everything, even if it is garbage, it is bullshit, they have, sorry for unparliament. I mean, they have recorded every single thing as if it is the ultimate truth. See the difference. The difference is all the texts, all Hindu texts, initial ones, before, Mus before Mughals came in, till that time, are mostly oral. Even Mahabharata, Upanishad, Veda, entire Vedanta, Puran, these are all Shrutis. They are, you, have, you hear it, you remember it, you pass it, on, pass it on to the next generation. If next generation feel there is a reason to improvise somewhere, to change something, refine it, you know, modify it, upgrade it, they can do it. And which is why you see the original Mahabharata and the Mahabharata you hear or read today are two different things. Same with Ramayana. Same with so many texts, because there was a scope to improvise as you live your life. But here, everything is written down except for the constitution. Am I right? So everything is catalogued. So there is no scope for human improvisation on a day-to-day -day basis. This is a fundamental difference in our approaches toward things. And I'm not saying what is right and wrong. We need both. Actually, in a good real world, you need both. You need vision, philosophical vision. At the same time, you need technique. You need both. But the problem is, because they were so methodical about the processes and the methods, they also invented guns, arms, ammunition, anything which helps you establish your power, physical power, trust me. And in the East, you will never find any history of invading others. Invasions have happened basically all over the world, not India, invasions, coloni colonizing uh, nations, all these things have happened basically from two kinds of people. The monarchs, kings, or barbarians. And today both of them are in majority if you speak globally. People who colonized their faith, the Christian faith, and the people who invaded like barbarians, Historically speaking, the Islamic faith, they are in majority. And Hindus are globally in a minority. This is how I see the difference. But how the, this is the truth, this is the reality. If you talk about the globalized world, Hindus are in minority. We are 15, 16% of the world population. Whereas the Christians and Islam, Islamic people, they are in huge, huge, huge majority. And they are very fast, very, very rapidly expanding religions also. Whereas Hinduism is a stagnant religion. 
If you see the last 10, 15 years, it's not increasing in the global percentage. In fact, it's reducing slowly. But the West always blames India of majority and minority. They are always saying that India is basically is a nation of majorities, which is Hindus, and minority, which is Muslims. But recently, few days ago, what did you experience? Are the Muslims in minority in India? Is it just an Indian matter? Or was it a global force which made the strongest party ever, the most powerful government ever to say sorry and sack their own spokesperson? It was the global united power. Do you see what I'm talking about? So first of all, the biggest mistake we do is looking at Hindus and Muslims only in Indian context because we are actually, we have arrived in a globalized world. And all this attack which is happening on you, it's true what the West says that if you are in majority, you are going to exploit and oppress the minority and you are going to shut them up. This is the truth. And this is why for last few years, Despite having your own government, despite being in majority, all Hindus are feeling as if they are unheard and something is wrong with them. It is happening at a global level. It's a show of strength. And there is definitely a war which is being waged against India. And this war is in three, four different dimensions. The first is a cultural war. There definitely is a cultural war and it is happening because of a global commerce, the global market. Because the Western world has to market its products, its services. And it is not possible if you have such diverse culture in India with every state celebrating different festivals, believing in different uh, things, eating different kind of food, wearing different kinds of clothes. It doesn't work for branded uh, marketing companies. They want one style all over the world. Today there is no British style of dressing. It's all one, whether you go to France, I travel all the time, you travel anywhere. You won't find any regional, local kind of dressing. Everybody is dressed the same way. Everybody is wearing the same Zara's and Gap's and those kind of clothes. And they are, they are available all over the world. The same design, same color, same everything. Food also. We used to go to Thailand earlier. There were hardly any McDonald's or Burger Kings. Now there are hardly any um, uh, Thai food you get over there. Do you know in Rajasthan, if you go to Jaipur, you can't get Rajasthani food in Jaipur. Anybody from Rajasthan here, it's from Jaipur. You would know that. You are from there. Next time you go there, try and look for Rajasthani food. You won't get even one restaurant which serves you Rajasthani food except for one, that tourist place. What is it called? I don't know. Chokidani. That's it. That's also such bad food. Today in India, if you want to buy a traditional rakhi, I promise you, you will, you can go market to market, you will not find a traditional rakhi. All those traditional rakhis are becoming these western bands which you wear. Because that way, it can be sold anywhere in the world. You have a basic design and change anything and it's a thread, that's it. Every festival, you see in Diwali, people have stopped giving mithais to each other. What are they giving? They are giving chocolates or some kind of a Western pack products which look huge, but inside there is hardly anything. <laughs> like America, everything looks so big, shallow from inside. <laughs> so this is the problem. There is a cultural war. Your definitions are slowly being changed. Jargon is being changed. Your lifestyle is being changed. And we are not even aware of this.
एनी फेस्टिवल यू सी एनी फेस्टिवल चाहे दिवाली हो चाहे होली हो चाहे राखी हो आपके सारे के सारे फेस्टिवल जो हैं वो दे हैव बिकम मोर देन सिक्सटी सेवेंटी परसेंट वेस्टर्नाइज एवरी सिंगल फंक्शन वेन आई वॉज ग्रोइंग अप इवन टिल टेन फिफ्टीन ईयर्स अगो एवरी सिंगल फेस्टिवल इन इंडिया वॉज सेलिब्रेटेड डिफरेंटली पीपल वो डिफरेंट काइंड ऑफ क्लोथ्स वॉट हैपन्स नाउ ओनली वन थिंग Western style partying, 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 drinking, 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 or ordering pizza. That's all happens in every single festival in India now. So this is the first war which is waged against India. It's called cultural war. The second is a financial war, which I have told you briefly. But that exactly also means the same thing: creating one market and therefore destroy the diversity of India. making south indians and north indians wear exactly the same kind of clothes that's the direction we are moving in and therefore every 15th day or once in a month there is some kind of an attack on sari and traditionally dressed indian women you see all the times it's trending women who wear bindi they are attacked these are slow things these kind of cultural wars are fought by first creating doubt so that somebody in your family questions it your daughter or your sister or brother or friend somebody questions that value and once people start questioning it after some time it becomes a common place normal place the second one is the economic war slowly like east india company a lot of things have been taken away from us once again we are becoming brown coolies this time instead of tea gardens in it industries i was reading a text when east india came company came to india you will be surprised to know at that time also some of the top leaders also said the same thing look our young boys and girls are doing so brilliantly is because of us that east india company is surviving today and the same kind of thing we say even now look because of us the global it industry is surviving because of indians it's not a matter of pride it's not a matter of pride definitely it's not a matter of pride to 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 actualize somebody else's dreams we talk about netflix let me tell you about my film industry how how colonization begins and it happens how do we become slaves look at indian film industry every any country when the world war happened white house invited people the top studios from hollywood and asked them to work as soft power to fight the world war billions and billions of dollars were spent in fact hollywood made lots of fake documentaries at that time showing that they had more arms and tanks and aircrafts and ammunition than they actually had in fact 10% was made to be blown up to 100% fake war scenarios were uh, shot and shown since then they have been using hollywood as their soft power every child in the world knows about these superheroes every child knows that the real threat is on america and therefore america must save humanity it has done some good things also it's not that it's done only bad things but it has actually marketed stereotypes but we failed and it's a really matter of shame as a as a as a indian as a filmmaker for me that our film industry failed to use it as a soft power and sorry i'm standing here this place is run by iccr um for 70 years there was no representation of cinema in iccr indian council for cultural relations because they thought that cinema is not culture i am the first representative from cinema in the governing council of iccr that also when i raised lot of voice i 
I created a lot of noise because I believe that films can be used as soft power for diplomacy, for uh, showing to showcasing your strengths to the world. So this cinema, which you talk Bollywood, actually there is nothing called Bollywood. They are all, all, all brown coolies, you can say. And I'll tell you why. In fact, people in Bollywood even do, they don't know this. Today, when you make a feature film or you make an OTT series, eventually who owns the copyright of that? Who owns the IPR? Almost 99% of Indian content's IPR is being owned by three American companies. Netflix, Amazon, and Disney. Now Star, whatever it is called now. And we are not even aware of this. I spoke to the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting. Two of them, not one. But they didn't care. Nobody, it doesn't matter to anyone. Now, 100 years later, when you will find that none of your content belongs to you and they manipulate the way content should be made, which already they are doing. And, and trust me, American film production studios are so smart. They are exceptionally brilliant. They know how to do this soft, psychedelic, uh, kind of subliminal kind of uh, narrative building so that the entire generation and this is what happened recently when Black Lives Matter happened. Almost every young Indian who was on Instagram was fighting for it. But today when Nupur's life is under threat by the real barbarians, not even one young teenager stands up and writes about it. Because they believe, they are made to believe that what is happening with Nupur, all Hindus deserve this. All Hindus deserve to die. Only black people should live. This, they are, their minds are conditioned like this. I'm not comparing Hindus and blacks. But I'm trying to say is a problem, an issue which doesn't affect your life at all. No Indian has this black and white problem. It doesn't exist, but you feel empathy for them or you need validation from them and you don't even care when your own daughter or sister is now under threat. Her effigies are being hanged on the wire there is, people are throwing stones all over the country. Children are being killed. People are, in Rachi something happened. And not one teenager is talking about it on Instagram as if it doesn't matter to you. So do we have tourists living in India? No. We have contract bonded intellectual laborers living in your country who feel more for Western issues and Western problems than their own problems. Problem is right here in front of you. And the problem is created by none other than the Britain. What did they do when they divided India? They very strategically, very smartly left a ticking bomb in our country. They divided us between a constitutional India constitutional state called India and civilizational state called Bharat. They made a clear cut divide between these two. And since then, this constitutional state called India is trying to defeat Bharat at any cost. And it is not very difficult to identify who is from constitutional state of India and who is from civilizational state of Bharat. It is very easy. Anybody who talks in terms of Secularism belongs to constitutional state of India. Because anybody who is from Bharat doesn't have to talk about it because being inclusive is his DNA. So this fight is between secular India versus inclusive Bharat. The constitutional state of India talks about being tolerant, that we should be tolerant. And that's why they say, now we are not intolerant. We are today, we are tolerant. Like it's a barometer, it's like the climate change they are every day noticing. Whereas this civilizational st state of Bharat, its DNA is total acceptance. If you're traveling in a train and you meet somebody and you eat some puri and aloo with them, 
and you create some kind of relationship after some time. I have grown up with so many people who were not my real mossies or chachas. They were just friends we met on, on a train. It's total acceptance. Now, Mishraji, Fissi, we met 2018, I think. And since then, it's total acceptance. He says, Vivek ji, karna. I say, yes. I say, ye karna. He says, yes. All of us, I've, I mean, all my relationships are based on total acceptance. This is the difference. And this is the war which is going on. And this India, the so-called India, I'm not trying to divide India further, but I'm just trying to point out where the real problem lies, you have to understand that. And which is why you will see when these kids are throwing stones, and when they are calling iska sar tan se zuda, uska sar tan se juda, isko kaat dalo, isko maar dalo, isko ye kar do, the blasphemy which everybody is throwing around, you see Bharat is really, really worried. But India is enjoying it. They are, they are so happy. They are celebrating it. Because it gives them, it gives them an evidence to prove to their masters, to the world, that there are indeed some kind of oppression taking place against minorities. It's another thing that it's the cops and peaceful people who are being hurt by those stones. And which is why I say that today Hindus have a big challenge. I'm not the kind who says that Hindu is in danger. Hindu is not in danger. Hindu is united. And I am not saying you have to become united to make an army and wage a war against it. All I am saying is, once we are united, we are such wonderful people, we are full of strengths. Our strength, I mean the day you realize your own strength, I am telling you, you won't need anything. Only once if you understand that if this world has to be saved from violence, barbarian behavior, and terrorism, the only answers lie in our philosophy, in our darshan. We have to now practice them. Nowhere it is written that only Shastra is enough. All our texts, be it Mahabharata or Ramayana, the two most sacred texts, they also say that it's only a combination of Shastra and Shastra which can make you win this great war of Dharma. And Shastra, and Shastra here do not mean arms. Shastra here means strategy. So you have wisdom of Shastra and you have strategy. You have tactics. And you use that strategy to win this. And in the end, I want to tell you where we are getting defeated. We are getting defeated because somewhere we have started mimicking their behavior. We are becoming reactionary. We need not react. We have to be proactive. We have to engage. Next time when you meet a Muslim boy or a girl, ask him only one thing. Say, I'm not asking you a religious question. I'm just asking you one thing. Are you with the terrorism? or you are against terrorism. No what about it, just ask him. Let him also reflect. The problem is, people have stopped asking them because the minute you ask, somebody says you are Islamophobic. They are using Islamophobia to shut you up. <laughs> Don't be scared of Islamophobia as just a political weapon. But start asking. Unless the entire Muslim community, in fact, the onus is on the Muslim community, and the, especially the educated Muslims of India, to put their hand on their chest and ask themselves, do they stand up with the terrorism, terrorist organizations and terrorism, or they are against it? If they are against it, why don't they speak up?
instead of being reactionary and saying you said this so i am saying this instead of abusing others attacking others we unitedly must all of us must ask this question unitedly and only one question are you with humanity or are you with terrorism let them think let them answer no what about re if yes but they said this they no yes and no i am against terrorism and i write about it i am for humanity and therefore i write about it they also need to answer this and therefore i engage with everybody i i i mean my worst critics can never blame me uh, for not engaging even with my enemies i have always engaged anybody who knows me i always say don't tell me how you are going to moderate these panels what's going to happen don't even tell me i tell journalists don't even tell me what questions you are going to ask i want to reply your questions extempore because shastrarth and debate is in my dna i don't have to learn it from anyone and therefore i engage with every i've just stopped recently because now it's very difficult to figure out which one is a congress bot and which one is a congress president so i don't know. <laughs> so i have recently stopped but so this is one of the reasons instead of fighting arguing with people instead of being scared we said the best thing is we specialize in art that is our core business why not show to the world the greatness of kashmir the greatness of a hindu civilization through our art and we chose a strategy our strategy was to show what has been destroyed what kind of great work of philosophy art literature beauty spirituality has been destroyed by barbarians we did not utter the word muslim we did not anywhere say pakistan or islam or anything we did not blame anyone we just showed what happens when terrorism destroys everything beautiful in humanity and now we have decided to make two more films my next film immediate film which is going to be uh, coming in early uh, 2023 we thought we should not just bring bad news all the times we should bring good news also so it is on the great achievement of our uh, uh, scientists who had no resources absolutely nothing no time and they were challenged with covid then how these women who were pregnant women looking after their in-laws their parent their children and with lot of difficulties no air conditionings no cars to drive around who they couldn't even go back to their homes they worked non stop for so many months uh in one place and within 7 months they created our own vaccine called co vaccine you know that so and how and how they saved 1.2 billion lives and how uh, this entire uh, vaccine program was undertaken i don't know if you have seen those pictures i start crying every time i see there's pregnant woman who climbed up the mountains for 5 hours gave a vaccine to just one family of three or four people then they climbed back 5 or 6 uh, uh, hours down so that kind of service dedication achievements of our film celebrates the excellence and the brilliance of our scientists especially women scientists which will come in 2023 after that in this trilogy after the tashkent files and the kashmir files our next film will come in 2024 sometimes um it's called the delhi files and this film is about the civilizational battle this civilizational war which i was explaining to you india versus bharat and this will uh, cover history of last 100 years from the day khilafat movement began in india and now the khilafat 2.0 as you are seeing in last few days especially since friday shaheen bagh and all these things so that will be a very very important film only with your blessings it will be possible for us to make it because i know for sure especially for the delhi files the whole world uh, would want that film not to be made and released but we have taken this pledge uh, we believe this is our dharma this is our life's purpose 
to ensure that film is made with honesty, sincerity, and a lot of research so that, that our next generation, wherever they are, at least they cannot blame us for not telling them the history, the true history, at the right time, like Kashmiri Hindus can complain that our history was not told to the world. So we don't want to live in that uh, kind of uh, um, times. So please bless us and thank you for listening to me so patiently. Thank you very much. <laughs>